Hi everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to Top 10 Middle Game Ideas. Uh, we're on to idea number two, the isolated queen's pawn. So let's uh, take a look at this game. Um, the first game here is uh, between Siegbert Tarash and David Janowski, who's played in Hastings, England in 18, 1895. And uh, Tarash was one of the foremost uh, practitioners of the isolated queen's pawn. So we'll see, first of all, how this position arises. He starts off d4, Janowski applies d5. Tarash and Janowski were actually both great attacking players, played some very interesting chess. Um, c4, e6, we've seen their games before in the, uh, in the attack the king portion of this series. So, but this is just an ordinary queen's gambit decline. Both sides are playing uh, top, top uh, moves, the top moves in the position. I don't know, actually, yeah, knight f3 is a little bit more popular than bishop g5, but this is certainly a very mainstream approach to the opening. Get all the pieces out. White gets a little more space in the center. Um, rook to c1 was played here by Tarash, a bit unusual. Normally they play uh, e3 first, but we're still in uh, known territory. And now Janowski decides to uh, start taking a few uh, pawns off. This uh, actually opens up some lines for black, so um, this has some advantage to the black player to just exchange things. Um, uh, Tarash plays e3 to just give himself a solid center and uh, get back the pawn. Um, let's see, c5 is played here, and um, he grabs the pawn. And now Janowski takes the d pawn, and Tarash takes back with the e pawn. So this is the isolated queen's pawn. I just wanted to get to this position so I could <laughs> talk about it, and you would have some idea of what I was talking about. So the characteristics of it are that uh, there are no pawns on either side, no pawns on either side, so that's it's isolated. Also, it's restrained, typically by the e-pawn, so it can't immediately uh, move forward. So it will uh, be a fixture of this uh, position for a while. And uh, it has both good and bad features. Um, in this first part, I'm going to be talking about the good features, and we will talk about maybe uh, the problems as we, as we move on. But I'm going to start out uh, with the positive aspects of the isolated queen's pawn. And uh, in particular, if you're an attacking player, you should be uh, happy to get... Uh, an isolated queen's pawn position because it does open up lots of attacking ideas. Um, so the pawn is restrained for the moment. One of the ideas is to just push it forward and dissolve that pawn and uh, that will open up squares. It'll open up uh, a square for your knight to hop into and it will also open up this diagonal which can be useful in some cases and it can be used to break down uh, this diagonal when you push that pawn forward. So it's an attacking idea just to push that pawn forward. And uh, But black, on the other hand, usually has time to organize his pieces and try and blockade that pawn. So black is going to try and restrain the pawn. Uh, white is looking for opportunities to push it forward or just to leave it here and uh, to use it to hang his pieces on. And uh, that's kind of what we will see in this game. So we're going to see a game where the, the pawn stays isolated. So let's see, knight c6 was played here, white castles. And now Janowski comes out with queen a5, hitting the bishop over here. Um, now the bishop isn't immediately loose, but um, Tarash decides that uh, it's done its job over here, uh, pinning the knight, provoking the bishop, and uh, he just drops back to f4. He has another idea. He's going to try probing along this diagonal. This actually doesn't really work out for him. Let's see, this rook immediately comes to the d-file, to restrain the d pawn, keep uh, keep it away from these, uh, <coughs> keep a break on that pawn, basically. Now knight to b5. This was uh, Tarash's idea to coordinate his knight and his bishop. Um, Janowski defends with knight to e8. Um, a slightly better defense might have been knight d5, but actually this is good enough. And um, after this, um, Tarash didn't didn't really see much going on in this diagonal. Dropped his bishop back. So this was a little bit. And oh, and then then. Um, Janowski kicks the knight with a6, and the knight drops back. So that was a bit of a wasted time, actually. White was kind of playing around with the bishop and moving it a couple of times. So, so not the most efficient way of proceeding, but he's got a, a pretty typical setup here. Now this knight just goes back to f6, and um, um, Tarash proceeds with queen e2, and b5 here, kicking the bishop. We're going to uh, get to another point in just a second here. Bishop to b3 drops back. Um, and now um, 
There should be seven, getting getting all the pieces out. Yeah, I want to get to a position where all the pieces come out. Rick to D1, just getting kind of logical deployment of the pieces. Um, knight to B4 now, and um, this knight hops up to E5. There's no real threat from the knight to B4. It's just using this square as a waypoint. Uh, we'll see, Rook A to C8. Finally, uh, Tarash decides to kick that knight, and the knight goes to D5. So this is the point I wanted to get to. It shows a typical kind of deployment where um, black has successfully blockaded that, that d-pawn. Notice that uh, the bishop and the rook, as well as this knight and f6, are all coordinating to, uh, to stop that uh, square and uh, um, <coughs> to stop the pawn from going forward by uh, blockading on that square d5. Now look at uh, how white has deployed his pieces. He's got one rook on the open file and one rook behind the d-pawn. I mean, another idea is to place the rook over here, um, but uh, typically you'll have a rook on the c-file, and this, this rook will be either behind the pawn or over here uh, on a neighboring file. Also, this, this file being half open, sometimes you get um, ideas of pushing the pawn forward and taking advantage of pins along the e-file, but uh, either, either deployment of that rook is good. You have a knight up here taking advantage of the protection afforded by that isolated queen's pawn. So this is what I mean by playing with the pawn. You know, white is not, has not been able to uh, push that pawn forward, but he's able to play with the pawn and he's got some good squares to hang his pieces on. Um, also notice that the, these neighboring squares here, that's, that's a square that's potentially available for a piece as well, and the open file. So uh, at this point, um, I would say there's, there's a pretty a good harmony in black's position except for the queen. Now the queen looks a little bit odd placed all the way over there. And so maybe at this point uh, black has not been entirely successful, but he's he's done a pretty good job here of, uh, of blockading things. But uh, Tarash spots this uh, maybe slight weakness in, um, in black's position, the slightly offside position of the queen, and decides to uh, initiate some exchanges here and just go directly into an attack. So the way he does it is he takes off this knight. Um, Janowski takes back with the knight. In general, he's playing with the idea of maintaining that isolated pawn, trading things off, and going for an end game where he might get an attack. Eventually, if this uh, pawn is still on the board into the end game and it's still restrained by a, a pawn uh, on black side, then it can become a weakness. But uh, Tarash is not afraid of that. He's, he's got an idea here. He trades off pair of rooks and brings his queen over to the king side. And now you can see things uh, starting to shape up. This knight, which is well posted here with the support of that pawn, is looking at the f7 square along with the queen. So Janowski blocks, the queen drops back to f3, and Janowski pushes forward with um, f5. Oh, let's back up. <clears throat> In this position, actually, the humble retreating move uh, Rook back to f8 might be the best defense. Um, he needs to uh, just kind of hold on to things and uh, buy some time for his queen to get back into the game. And that, that would probably be probably be okay for um, black. I didn't want to give the impression this is already hopeless. But, um, but you know, people can make mistakes when you, when you start attacking them. They don't always defend in the best possible way. So this, these moves here weaken the, queen, the king side. And um, he has an idea of getting his queen back into the game. But um, now that the queen, uh, now that white's queen is blocked on the uh, F file here, it shifts over to the G file. And uh, there's ideas of sacrificing the knight on uh, G6. The king comes forward to defend these pawns. And now just uh, launching the H pawn forward. So this part of the game you could easily have fit into the previous series, the Attack the King series, a very classic kind of attack. Got a centralized knight. You got bishops looking out on the king side, and now you want to weaken the king side further with this pawn push. Um, so Janowski brings his queen back, but uh, it's actually too late already. There's a really clever uh, tactic right here if you want to uh, uh, see if you can spot the tactic. Okay. Um, might not be obvious that this wins material immediately, but this tactic is uh, is good enough to uh, <clears throat> well get your pieces in to the attack. That's what this tactic is accomplishing. You can place this bishop on h6 with check, 
because if the king takes it, knight here, it forks the king and the queen. So that was kind of an unfortunate placement of the queen. Maybe if it had come back to c7, it would have been a little better. But um, but black was already in trouble. This pawn was going to come in and, and weaken the king's side, so white already had a pretty good attack. Anyway, the king has to drop back to g8, and now this sacrifice works. If... Uh, if black were to take, which he didn't do, he gets baited in short order, just to show this. Um, <clears throat> the king has no squares to run to, and the, the queen has no way to block it, so that's that's just a forced mate there. In the game, he tried um, bishop to f6, but um, after this move, knight e5, check, he resigned. He's just down a pawn, and uh, his king is all exposed to the attack, and... Uh, it's not, it's not, there's no immediate mate on the horizon, but uh, it's a lost game at this point, and he resigned. So that's our first example of an isolated queen's pawn position. Let's go back and take a look at the next game. This next game I wanted to show you, um, it was played by Mikhail Botvinnik. Uh, this is Botvinnik against uh, Abram Kavin from 1944, the USSR Championship. Uh, Botvinnik started off with uh, e4 and Kavin played um, c6, so we get the Karo Khan, d4, d5. And now there are different ways to play the Karo Khan, but um, there's uh, pushing the pawn forward, there's defending it with knight to um, knight to c3, but the way that Botvinnik plays is known as the Panov Botvinnik attack. Uh, he takes, and then he plays c4. So this is uh, a setup for going into an isolated queen's pawn position. Either uh, black will take or, or white will take, and uh, black takes back with a piece, and we get an IQP. So knight f6 uh, defending, and knight c3 putting more pressure. Uh, e6, knight f3, just normal developing moves, bishop e7. And now uh, Botvinnik decides to go for that uh, isolated queen's pawn by taking here. Of course, uh, black could still take back with a pawn, but black is... Um, usually um, okay at, at this point to see the isolated queen's pawn. He has ideas for playing against it in the future, particularly if uh, lots of pieces get traded off. This might become a weakness, as we've said. Um, and uh, the reason I chose this game is uh, for two reasons. One is that uh, I wanted to show the isolated queen's pawn coming out of a different opening besides a queen's pawn opening. And then secondly, uh, because I wanted to talk about the ways this uh, pawn structure can transform. Um, so let's go on a few moves. Bishop to c4, knight to c6, castles, a6, preparing b5, rook to e1, and b5. Okay, so now um, white is at a crossroads. He's got to uh, do something with this bishop, and um, and Botvinnik chooses to take the knight. And so this uh, changes the structure. After this, this is no longer going to be an isolated queen's pawn because black has to take back with the pawn. And um, we'll get a different structure. So this is a kind of transformation you can sometimes get out of an isolated queen's pawn. This structure is known as the ram structure, and it has a completely different uh, uh, character to it. Uh, if we back up to a situation where we have the isolated queen's pawn, there are dynamic uh, possibilities with this pawn uh, coming forward and opening things up, um, uh, and as we said, as we saw in the previous game, you can also play just leaving the pawn here and uh, use that to support your pieces. Uh, but after the trade, this is a, a static position. These pawns can't move, and there are no neighboring pawns to uh, to uh, use as levers to push the other pawn out of the way. So this is going to be a static structure for the rest of the game, unless uh, and somebody loses a pawn. Maybe there's some weird tactic that will arise, but but this is going to be a fixed part of the uh, game for a while. And so you can start to think about um, well, how, how are the uh, pieces going to work around these pawns. And you can see, if you look at it, that we've got uh, some bad bishops here. This bishop um, you know, isn't going to have a lot of scope, and this bishop isn't going to have a lot of scope. And in fact, uh, immediately after the trade, um, Botvinnik goes bishop g5 to provoke a trade of the dark squared bishop, getting rid of uh, his bad bishop and trading it for uh, this bishop here, which is pretty good. Um, now, this bishop is pinned at the moment, so um, black liberates it by castling, but now uh, Botvinnik just trades it off. And now th this game goes into a maneuvering phase, because this is, uh, even though there are open lines, the, the structure in the center is static, so this really has some uh, resemblance, in a way, to a closed position where you get a lot of maneuvering. 
And uh, rather than go through all that in detail, I will just uh, wind forward. Just uh, you can see the players moving their pieces around. And um, Black has done something interesting. He's uh, activated this rook, and he's got a plan of going after the uh, the uh, pawn. And the, the other thing about these pawns in this particular structure, the ram structure is that they have to be supported by pieces so they can come under attack. Um, and now it looks like the uh, the rook and the knight are coordinating to uh, gang up on um, on white's uh, deep pawn. But on the other hand this looks like kind of an unnatural uh, placement for these pieces and Botvinnik manages to exploit that uh, in a bit. But first he, he pauses to defend his deep pawn. Now this rook comes to the center and the knight goes to g3. So this uh, immediately uh, tries to resolve some issues. Notice that um, this pawn is under defended at the moment, but there's also the threat of uh, taking this rook off and grabbing the d pawn by distracting the queen. So black strikes first, black trades, and uh, that's forced because that's with check. And then now you might think um, he could grab the pawn here, but he didn't. <laughs> so just to look at that, if he were to play um, Knight takes here, and there's a sneak trick. That actually, this pawn is under defended. The queen is tied to the back rank because of the uh, mate threat here. So that little tactic explains why. Um, uh, now that that is a playable line. I don't want to give the idea that that's uh, bad or anything. But uh, Kavin decided he wanted to hold on to his pawn, and so he just dropped his knight back to e7 to defend it. And now. Um, there's a threat of this bishop coming out, suddenly suddenly gaining some life and kicking the queen around. H3 is played, and the king goes to f8 here to defend the knight and also to uh, guard against uh, these uh, back rank mate threats. So now the queen goes to e3, finally uh, defending this pawn, and we get some more maneuvers. Knight c6, putting pressure on it this way, knight drops back to b3. Queen to e7, offering a queen trade, which uh, Botvinnik declines. Drops his queen back, and uh, now this queen has to move. It goes to d6, and now he goes to knight a5. And uh, we've reached, actually, the critical point of the game. So Botvinnik is attacking this knight, and notice that uh, his knight cannot be taken because uh, the queen will grab this bishop back here with check, and, uh, in fact, it's mate because the rook is still guarding the escape square of the king. So... Black still has a back rank problem, and now you see that uh, this uh, rook over here is, is uh, big trouble. Um, now, in this position, um, um, Black defended with bishop to d7, and that's that, uh, the losing move, actually. He needs to defend with uh, rook to h6 because uh, this rook is loose over here, and uh, we'll see why in a minute because Black exploits that. But, uh, I mean, Botvinnik exploits that. So bishop to d7 was played, and now uh, Botvinnik trades off this knight. Queen takes, and then queen to g5 is a, a devastating double attack because he's hitting the rook, which is undefended, as I mentioned, and he's also threatening to come in to e7. And uh, after the rook moves, rook h6, queen e7 check. Uh, I think he resigned at this point. Yeah, nah, no more moves. So this is just a, mate, a forced mate. The king gets kicked back, and then the queen can check here. Just to show it, the bishop can block, but it doesn't help. That would be the end of the game. So um, he resigned after queen e7 check. So a nice uh, finish from Botvinnik. And um, it just shows, uh, the main idea I wanted to show here was how the isolated queen's pawn position can transform into other kinds of positions, in this case, a ram structure. And you have to keep these transformations in mind as you're playing with the IQP and uh, look for those opportunities because you may get into one of these situations that is favorable. What you have to look out for is, um, you know, how is this fixed structure going to affect uh, the pieces. Are they going to find good squares around these pawns because these pawns are going to be here for a long time. Okay, let's uh, take a look at the next game. The last game I wanted to show in this video was uh, played between uh, Jonathan Penrose and uh, Zandor Nilsson in, at the uh, Varna Olympiad in 1962. Uh, Penrose was a 10-time uh, UK champion. Uh, I think that's the most ever. I think that's a record.
Uh, also, he's the brother of the physicist Roger Penrose. You may have heard of him. And his opponent, uh, Zandor Nilsson, was a two-time Swedish champion. So battle of champions here. Um, game starts off E4, C6. So we actually um, get a, the same variation, the Pan of Botvinnik attack. Let's just uh, put the first few moves up here. And Knight of 6. I think uh, the other game went the same way up to a certain point. Knight C3, E6, Knight F3. Bishop e7, c takes, and knight takes. And now this is where um, Botvinnik played bishop to c4. Uh, Penrose goes with bishop d3, another good place for the bishop in this IQP structure looking out over this open file here. This is, uh, you know, with the intent to play along this diagonal. Um, when the bishop is posted here, this is often with the intent to push the d-pawn forward, and when it's posted here, um, because, uh, you know, controlling this diagonal, <laughs> that's a terrible line. If the bishop is on this diagonal, um, then the, sometimes you want to push the d-pawn forward and, and bust up the center. Um, whereas when the bishop is on uh, this diagonal, you're looking more at a direct kingside attack and probably intending to keep the uh, pawn where it is. Okay, the game continued with uh, knight c6, castles, both sides castle, rook e1, putting the rook on the uh, half-open file here. And now... Um, we see a type of uh, transformation that often happens uh, going from an isolated queen's pawn to, um, well, this is uh, potential hanging pawns. Uh, when he trades here, he brings a pawn forward. So this has strengthened uh, the center pawn here, the, the queen's pawn. If this pawn were to move forward once again, and we had pawns on c4 and d4, that's the uh, hanging pawn configuration. And you often see that um, Black will try and restrain those pawns with b6 and uh, then line up his heavy pieces against them, try and get pressure against those two pawns. Um, it's a very double-edged position, the hanging pawn structure, uh, because those pawns can dynamically choose to go forward on the d file or the c file to bust things up, or they can try and maintain themselves there and control a lot of squares. Um, but they have to, but they can come under attack. So interesting and double-edged positions, but uh, uh, Penrose has a different idea here. Uh, he plays after um, b6. Um, you know, Black is uh, preparing for the possibility of the, the hanging pawns, but also opening up a, a square for his bishop to develop to. Um, Penrose just lines up here with his queen. So his intent is actually to keep these pawns here and use them as a, kind of a shield for his pieces while he sets up for a kingside attack. Notice that these two pawns uh, control these dark squares, so the knight, for example, can't hop into uh, uh, b4 there and harass the queen. So these are very handy. These are very handy attacking uh, uh, pawns to have. Handy pawns to have for the attacking player. Anyway, uh, Xander um, blocks the diagonal with g6. Now bishop to h6, kicking the uh, rook away. Um, and h4, just going straight for the attack. So once again, uh, this is a game that uh, could have been taken out from the Attack the King series, but I just want to show how these different pawn structures uh, enable you to set up for the king side attack. Um, bishop to f8, trying to neutralize the pressure of this bishop, but um, this bishop just drops back to g5, uh, hitting the queen, and get bishop to e7, defending. And now... Um, bishop to b5, so leaving this here and um, giving black a moment to try and organize his defenses. Bishop to d7 was played. The queen comes out to e4, preparing to move over to the queen side. This uh, knight goes to a5, wanting to exchange uh, off this light squared bishop, you know, maybe reduce the pressure a little bit. But uh, well, the knight's a bit out of play now. And after this exchange, bishop takes, queen takes, this knight hops into e5, and we can see that uh, black is very well posted for a uh, kingside attack. And uh, this move came with tempo. The knight comes, hits the queen. The queen drops back. And then there's one final move here. And, uh, and then uh, black resigns. So if you want to uh, guess the next move from white here. Okay, uh, I'm going to give the answer away. What uh, Penrose played in this position was knight takes f7, and uh, and there's just nothing, no good answer for that. The, the point is that if the king takes, 
then queen here, check, uh, drives the king back, probably here, and then um, uh, white gets the piece back and he's two pawns up and the king is exposed. So that's a, a hopeless position. And um, But if he doesn't take, uh, let's see, he needs to move the queen, um, then, uh, well, the knight just drops back. It can come back to uh, h6 with check, come back to these squares. But in the long run, uh, this, this pawn can't be defended. This knight is too far away from uh, where things are happening. Yeah, I think the simplest way is to uh, um, just move this knight with check and then grab the pawn. So, um, so black is going to be two pawns down regardless. And uh, so after uh, knight takes f7, Xander resigned. So anyway, interesting game. And um, that's uh, this first part of, um, of the isolated queen's pawn. And the next part, I'm going to look at more positions with the isolated queen's pawn. I'm going to start up looking at things from the point of view of the side with the isolated queen's pawn. So I'm going to continue with that for a video or two, and then, uh, then we'll start looking at it from the other side. Uh, the uh, defensive ideas that the player playing against the isolated queen's pawn have, has. I wanted to add that, um, you know, I think you, it's uh, helpful to learn how to play these positions from both sides. Um, if you're an attacking player, you may be more comfortable playing with the isolated queen's pawn, but uh, um, you should at least know how to, uh, how to defend against it if you have to play against it. And um, and also knowing how to play both sides means that um, you won't fear certain openings, you won't fear certain moves, but you'll just be able to look at um, the position on the board, look at the alternatives that are available for you, and if the best choice is to go into one of these IQP positions from either side, then uh, being confident and knowing how to play it means that you'll be able to make the right decision there and go into that when that's the best option available. Okay, um, leave any comments you have in the section below, and I will see you again soon. Bye.